27th of October 2017, we received a bundle of documents delivered to our whistleblower unit on uh, making allegations not only against Mr. Guazo but also against two other officers of the SEC. On that basis, I asked the head of the whistleblower unit to investigate. We did not immediately suspend Mr. Guazo because every allegation is just that. It's an allegation. It must be uh, subject to some scrutiny. And the policy of the whistleblower unit is they have two levels of investigation. One is cursory and the other is detailed. Due to the seniority of Mr. Guazo in the market and the potential impact of the matter, I asked them to go straight to level two, which is you either prove a case or we throw this out. They came back with evidence that suggested that there was a very real need to issue a query to Mr. Guazo, which is the procedure. Mr. Guazo was then queried. He responded. But unfortunately, his responses contradicted the evidence that we had at hand. For example, Mr. Guazo claimed they had resigned from the company. But the evidence we had from CAC showed him to still be a director and shareholder. So on that basis, we felt there was a need to do more work. I sent then the team back again and this explains the, the delay between his response and his eventual suspension. Back again, because when you have two pieces of conflicting evidence, he's, he attested that he had resigned in 2012. Meanwhile, CAC was still showing him to be both a director and a shareholder. So we needed to get other evidence. So we then went to bank records and found that Mr. Munir remained a signatory to that account. And we obtained evidence of banking transactions where he signed as a director. That then, for me, became conclusive evidence that the position he had maintained in his memo was incorrect, or at least unreliable. And on that basis, we took, had an internal meeting where we looked at all the evidence. At the same time, we were receiving information from the staff of SEC that documents were being removed, and we knew that we needed to do a thorough investigation. Of course, that investigation could not be done with Mr. Munir still at the helm of affairs in SEC. And that was when we took the decision to suspend Mr. Munir. As the Director Legal has said, we followed public service rules uh, in, in terms of, uh, of doing so. And let me now that I have the floor speak to the administrative panel of inquiry, which was then set up, which is the procedure, under the Permanent Secretary of Finance, to do a detailed report, which is then, or, or is being submitted, or has been yesterday submitted to me. I am reviewing it, and I shall be making my recommendations to Mr. President. Mr. Munir is not removed, he has been suspended, and he is not the first DG of SEC to be suspended. In the absence of a board, the minister does, as the director legal say, have powers to suspend. Now, Mr. Munir's, uh, the, the allegations are quite serious, and I say this because in capital market we have a concept of fit and proper. I was a capital market operator for many years. To be in the capital market, you must be a fit and proper person. The standard expected of a capital market operator is very high. The standard of a capital market regulator is even higher. And when we are taking disciplinary actions against people, we must be seen to be above reproach, or else those actions will be questioned. And that was the challenge that we were having. The company in, in, in contention were alleging that the person who was investigating them was not a fit and proper person to do so and felt that his, his actions were colored. And that, had, that suspicion needed to be removed. Mr. Munir, on the issue of, um, of um, his severance pay or, uh, the, that he collected, we have investigated it. We have also looked, he made some uh, um, um, positions that Similar was done in Central Bank. We have gone to Central Bank. That is not the case. As far as we are concerned, the overruling of the recommendation of the director legal was improper. And if there was any contention, it should have been referred to the ministry to adjudicate. You cannot judge in your own case and then pay yourself. It's, ne it's never done. And there's no history of somebody collecting 104 million one day and resuming on another desk in the same organisation the next day. On the issue of Medusa investment, which was one of the allegations, Mr. Munir said he resigned in 2012. 
as I said, we obtained documents from CAC showing him to, rem to still be a major shareholder and also a director. Now, um, um, honourable members, you will know that under public service rules, and I will quote, Rule 030424 expressly states as follows. Public officers are not prohibited from holding shares in both public and private companies operating in Nigeria or abroad, except that they must not be directors in private companies and may only be directors in public companies if nominated by government. As we speak, Mr. Munir is director in two companies, so he has violated public service rules, and we have proved that. Secondly, the Investment and Securities Act says as follows, the Director General and full-time commissioner shall devote their full-time service to the commission while holding office and shall not hold any other office or employment except where appointed by virtue of their office in the commission into membership of the board or any agency of government in Nigeria or any international organization to which the commission is a member or affiliate. In this case, the Administrative Panel of Inquiry found he is a director and a shareholder in Medusa. He is also a, um, sending and signing bank mandates for that company, but that company has not transacted with SEC. But that in itself is a breach. But of more concern is the second company, Outward, okay. Outbound Investments, where he is... He claimed in his uh, submission that he was representing his wife, that it is his wife's family company, and his participation was as a representative of his wife. But that is not provided for in public service rules. And of more concern is the fact that that company has transacted with the SEC in the supply of diesel. So there is a conflict of interest. And that is what the administrative panel has looked into. Now, as I've said, there were many allegations, some of which were not substantiated, and we have discountenanced them. But the three significant ones administrative panel has looked into, Mr. Munir was called, he was given right of audience, he came, he has made written submissions, and therefore we believe that our decision to suspend Mr. Munir was vindicated. We cannot have somebody sitting at the helm of affairs and, and to suggest that it's only when EFCC arrests them that then they can be removed. That's not good for Nigeria. We don't have to wait for our officers to be paraded in handcuffs before the international community, before we take action. We small a solemn oath to serve the people. And we must sometimes have to make very, very tough and unpalatable decisions. We didn't take this decision easily. We knew that he would try to link it to Orlando, but we have to stand up and do the right thing. It would, the, Orlando is listed both in Canada and in, uh, in South Africa. Why would we wait until uh, uh, the DGSEC is in handcuffs before we take action? That's not governance. So that's why we took a preemptive action to get him out of SEC, investigate. And you will recall in the previous suspension, the DG was then recalled. So you are, after being suspended, you either um, exonerated and recalled or other action is taken. So I think that the position that we took to suspend Mr. Munir was the right one. It instilled confidence in the capital market. It told investors that Nigeria takes seriously issues of integrity and that their funds, which we, have, which we work very, very hard to attract into Nigeria, are safe. That decisions that are being taken are being taken by fit and proper persons. I think that the current management of the SEC will be in a better position to speak to my position on Oando. But let me state for the record. Oando is a completely separate situation to, the, to Munir Guazo, totally and completely separate. The allegation that I gave an instruction that the forensic audit should stop is laughable. And I'm sure you saw the, the SEC team laughing because they know that that work is ongoing even as we speak. So it is not true. It is mischievous to even suggest that that was the case. Many many decisions taken by SEC and the, and the suspended DG alluded to them, some of which involve my personal friends. The only thing I would ask for as the minister, and I'm not a rubber stamp, send me the files. Look at the files. Once I can follow your decisions, I endorse. Personal friends. I don't interfere. But where there is need for guidance, that is the job of the ministry. And our job in this case was to guide and to say, these are the areas in which you need to focus on. There was opportunity for us to have even reversed the suspension. We did not. So why would we then, why link in the, the, the two matters that are completely unrelated? I think it's very, very poor. I think it's very, very poor, Chairman. And I think Mr. Munir should face 
the allegations that relate to his violation of public service rules, which are the real reasons why he has been, and the only reasons why he was suspended and remains suspended. And I shall be making my recommendations to Mr. President today in line with the recommendations of the administrative panel of inquiry, which I received yesterday. Thank you very much. I'll start from the extreme left, two minutes. And please, be mindful of the fact that we don't have time. Honorable Minister, take your pen, note your question, Director of Legal, note the question, Director of Legal, I need your attention, take your bio. Honorable Abanta. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, huh. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Right Honorable Chairman. Uh, let me appreciate the acting DG, the suspended DG, and the minister for all contributions made so far. First of all, I'd like to briefly, first of all, I'd like to briefly express my concern like the minister said, that is regrettable to be here on an issue like this. We, we know the perception and what impact it can create to the capital market to find out that the leadership of the regulator and the minister are on issues like this. But very important, I want, I want to stress on the fact that, yes, you, don't, you hardly get the DG, suspended DG, acting DG, and minister in the same hall. And we're talking about investors' confidence here. So primarily, exactly what the CBN governor will do in the monetary market is what is expected in the capital market. How have, this, how have you protected the capital market? How exactly have you tried to install confidence? For example, okay. the CBN governor, uh, one more question, please. Uh, yeah, one question, hammer. please. The CBN governor did say some time ago that even shareholders cannot use shares as collateral. To what extent have the share Honorable capital market been protected? Honorable Hammer. By, no, one, one more, one minute. So, well, for the minister, I will, I will, I appreciate your legal director who has talked about the, is it reversal of the other two uh, officers? But for the DG, you had said you are acting in line with uh, public service rules and um, as. As the minister, there's no board. My question now is, you will be preemptive to have said you didn't need to wait for the suspended DG to be in handcuffs. There are allegations that you are being... I am forced to say your two minutes is up. Okay, thank you. Honorable... Uh, thank you. Uh, let me check off. About uh, two minutes, I'll be strict. Honorable minister, still under protest, I'll ask. You said your actions were preemptive. Two, um, the suspended DG accused you copiously of...